Up next in the broadcast, Washington says it won't lower the bar to rush into talks with North Korea on denuclearizing the peninsula, according to U.S. envoy Sung Kim, who is in Seoul to meet with his South Korean counterpart, Pang Joon-kuk. During a speech on Korea's 51st a trade day, President Park Geun-hye calls for innovation in the nation's manufacturing industry by combining technologies from the IT sector. NASA's first spacecraft in more than a generation prepares for launch into orbit after technical problems forced a postponement of Thursday's scheduled blastoff. Primetime News begins now. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Primetime News, coming to you live from Seoul. I am Kang Tiri. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Washington's top nuclear envoy, Sung Kim, met with his South Korean counterpart, Hwang Chung Kuk, in Seoul, where much of the talk focused on North Korea and its nuclear program. Mm, and this comes as uh, the nuclear envoys of uh, China and Japan also met in Beijing on this Friday to talk about North Korea. Our Lee Ji has more. Washington is not lowering the bar for restarting nuclear talks. U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Policy Sung Kim says the fate of the stalled six-party talks depends on Pyongyang. It would be a mistake for us to rush back to negotiations unless we can have some confidence that the North Koreans are ready to work with us uh, in a sincere and serious manner towards uh, complete verifiable denuclearization. The former U.S. ambassador to South Korea met with his South Korean counterpart Hwang jung Kuk on Friday in Seoul. There, Kim said the U.S. wants to resume negotiations and that its diplomatic doors are open to North Korea, but that the North has refused to walk through them. The meeting between the nuclear envoys from Seoul and Washington follows a visit by North Korean special envoy Choi ryong hye to Russia last month. There, Che reportedly said Pyongyang was ready to resume the talks on its nuclear program without preconditions. Next week, Kim will travel to Japan and China, both participants of the six-party talks, to discuss the North Korean issue once again. Lee Ji-yoon, Arirang News. South Korea is looking to heighten the level of its crackdown on illegal Chinese fishing in its waters. Officials from Korea's ruling party and government have reviewed plans to confiscate uh, fish that are uh, illegally caught and discard the Chinese fishing boats used to catch them. Also discussed was the possibility of boosting the budget and workforce of related authorities here in Korea. This comes as hundreds of Chinese fishermen are arrested every year for illegally fishing in Korean waters. South Korea also plans to hold talks on this issue with China later this month. The Korean economy heavily relies on exports, and the vast majority of those exports are manufactured goods. But with increasing global competition, President Park Geun-hye says the manufacturing sector needs innovation, and that uh, that exactly she will, where she will support. Our Hwang Ji has the details. Despite the sluggish global economy, Korea is expected to post record numbers in trade surplus, exports and trade volume this year. In fact, Korea has already breached the $1 trillion mark in annual trade for the fourth straight year. But what's more surprising is that it's not just the country's largest conglomerates that are leading the rise, it's also small and mid-sized companies. The pace of export growth among smaller firms is more than three times faster than that of large companies. While expressing gratitude to local exporters, President Pakana emphasized during a speech marking the nation's 51st trade day that they cannot simply rest on their laurels. To do this, President Park pledged to cut red tape support startups in the manufacturing sector and support research and development for new growth engines. 
Puck added that the government will foster the growth of 400 companies so they can become global players with exports of more than $100 million a year by the year 2017. 수출 경험이 없는 기업들이 손쉽게 해외 시장의 문을 두드릴 수 있도록 전문 무역 상사를 통한 간접 수출을 지원하고 전자 상거래 수출을 활성화하겠습니다. President Park also asked companies to actively utilize Korea's free trade deals with various countries. This year, Korea reached agreement on FTAs with China, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. While deflation worries are back in the headlines here in Korea, a survey shows that average Korean consumers are not necessarily feeling prices are getting lower. The Korea Rural Economic Institute says that in a survey of more than 6,000 people, respondents perceive prices of everyday grocery items actually rose 14 percent on average this year compared to last year. Volatile food and energy prices are not included in official inflation measurements. This is the second consecutive year where consumers perceived prices to go up by two digits. The global patent battles between tech giant Samsung Electronics and Apple have largely wrapped up, but the two are fiercely fighting over a nearly $1 billion fine against Samsung Electronics for lifting iPhone patents. Shin Se-min reports on how Korea's largest tech firm is asking an appeals court to reverse the decision. Samsung Electronics wants a U.S. appeals court to throw out an earlier court's order that it pay Apple 930 million U.S. dollars for infringing on iPhone patents when it made its Galaxy range of smart devices. Stressing the design and the look of the company's devices are different from iPhones, Samsung's lawyer Caitlin Sullivan said the damages award was excessive and unwarranted. Making the Korean company's case at the U.S. District Court in California on Thursday, Sullivan said the lower court was wrong to decide Apple's design patents were infringed upon because the Samsung devices do not carry an Apple logo, do not have a home button, and the speaker spots are in different places. She said it was absurd to make Samsung pay Apple its total profit for the Galaxy devices, likening it to giving back the entire profits on a car just because it infringed another automaker's cup holder. Apple's attorney, William Lee, dismissed Samsung's argument and said the $930 million award was fair. Reports say the three judges did not indicate when they would reach their decision. The massive award to Apple is the largest set in any of the so-called smartphone wars. The patent lawsuit between Apple and Samsung began back in 2007 and has rumbled on for years. Samsung and Apple agreed in the summer to drop their patent litigation outside of the U.S., though they have yet to settle their broader dispute. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The Japanese yen dropped to a new seven-year low all the way down to the psychologically important 120 mark against the greenback. The yen tumbled to as low as 120.25 before pulling back a little to close at 119.78 in New York on Thursday. The Japanese currency has been on a downward spiral for months, particularly since the Bank of Japan announced new stimulus measures to boost the economy in October. So far this year, the yen has fallen over 13 percent against the dollar. The yen also fell 0.7 percent against the euro on Thursday. NASA has made landmark progress on Friday, sending a capsule into space for the first time in 40 years. It's part of a program that aims to reach the moon and Mars. Chiyosung has more. Two, one, and liftoff at dawn. With Thursday's gusty winds and technical problems behind, NASA passed a milestone in its ambitious space program Friday by launching a space capsule as far away possible from Earth. Aboard a Delta IV heavy rocket, the Lockheed Martin-built unmanned Orion spacecraft catapulted into the atmosphere at 7.05 a.m. Eastern Time from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. 
Orion's four-and-a-half-hour test ride, which will circle around the Earth twice at a high altitude of 5,800 kilometers, is part of NASA's endeavor to eventually fly astronauts far into space, including Mars. Since the end of the Apollo moon project in 1972, the U.S. and other space-exploring nations have limited their space travel to within several hundred kilometers from the Earth. With the completion of NASA's very own rocket or space launch system, the Orion is scheduled to embark on a second unmanned journey in about four years' time, followed by another trip around the moon carrying two astronauts around year 2021. After hitting a peak temperature of more than 2,000 degrees Celsius while falling back to Earth at a speed of up to 30,000 kilometers per hour, the Orion will land in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Baja, California, four hours and 23 minutes into its mission. The capsule will then be sent to San Diego for further research. Che Yusan, Arirang News. A college professor in Seoul was recently detained on charges of sexually assaulting dozens of his students over the years. And there are also allegations that the head of the Seoul Philharmonic Orchestra sexually harassed her employees. It's developments like these that have prompted the police to roll up their sleeves to fight sexual abuse. Connie Lee has this next report. It's being seen as a new push in the fight against sexual abuse here in Korea. The National Police Agency has announced that a special division will be set up next year solely dedicated to investigating sexual abuse allegations. The agency says it wants to reduce the number of cases here in the nation and strengthen investigations into victims' reports. This announcement comes amid a recent string of sexual abuse and harassment cases involving some high-profile men. Just this past Wednesday, a professor at Seoul National University was detained on charges of sexually harassing his intern. A professor at Korea University, another prestigious school, recently resigned after accusations he sexually abused a student. And a former prosecutor general is also under the spotlight for allegedly molesting a female employee at a country club. It's merely a small sample size, as many cases are believed to go unreported. The victims this time were brave enough to stand up against these powerful men. The media attention on this is positive and hopefully signals a change in how Korea deals with sexual abuse, especially involving high-profile people. The National Police Agency's latest plans shows its determination to combat sexual abuse. Earlier this year, the agency set up a special task force in well over 100 regions throughout Korea to investigate sexual abuse cases. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Shifting now to the Middle East, an American hostage held by al-Qaeda's affiliate in Yemen says his life is in danger. This, as the U.S. military said, it tried but failed to rescue him last month. With more, we turn to Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul, this militant group in Yemen recently released a new video. What did they say? Well, the leader of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula denounced what he calls American crimes against the Muslim world and has threatened to kill 33-year-old Luke Summers by the end of this week if their demands are not met. Our Sun jung in reports. In a three-minute video posted by al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula on Thursday, the terror group's leader threatened to kill an American hostage, claiming the U.S. had committed crimes against the Muslim world. Nasser bin Ali Alansi gave the U.S. three days to meet unspecified demands that he said Washington was aware of. We give the American government a time frame of three days from the issuance of this statement to meet our demands, about which they are aware. Otherwise, the American hostage held by us will meet his inevitable fate. Soon after the statement, Luke Summers, a British-born American, appears in the footage pleading for the U.S. government to save his life. The 33-year-old photojournalist was kidnapped last September in the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, while working for the Yemen Times. My name is Luke Summers. It's now been well over a year since I was kidnapped in Sana'a. Basically, I'm looking for any help that can get me out of this situation. I'm certain that my life is in danger. 
The threat comes more than a week after a rescue attempt by the United States Yemeni mission freed eight hostages kidnapped by Al Qaeda's Yemen branch. During the joint operation, however, the military is known to have failed to locate other five hostages, including Mr. Summers. Son Jung In, Arirang News. Entering to South America, the UN Climate Change Co Conference is in full swing in Peru, with the impact of rising global temperatures at the top of the agenda. The long term trend is believed to be behind a series of extreme weather events that are growing in both frequency and intensity. Our Kwan Soa has more. November 2013. Typhoon Haiyan slams into the Philippines, killing more than 6,000 people and turning the lives of millions of others upside down. Now, another super typhoon is bringing back memories of last year's nightmare. Typhoon Ruby is forecast to make landfall within the next two days. It's superstorms like Ruby that are sounding alarm bells worldwide about the effects of climate change. It is a major topic of conversation at UN climate negotiations in Peru. When we were in Doha, it was Typhoon Bhopal. When we were in Warsaw, it was Typhoon Haiyan. And now that we are here in Lima, we are facing Typhoon Ruby, which is also a Category 4 um, super typhoon. We need you to get your acts together to meaningfully respond to the urgency of climate action. Many experts agree that global warming intensifies extreme weather events. That's why the biggest major climate conference this year aims to set a long-term treaty to keep global temperatures from rising more than 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. It's part of the global push to reduce carbon emissions, with extra pressure being exerted on the world's two worst polluters, China and the United States. At the UN General Assembly Thursday, Secretary General Ban Ki moon welcomed new pledges out of Beijing, Washington, and the EU, including Germany, to cut emissions. Next year is an opportunity to take big steps, transformative steps in the right direction. We must do all it takes to provide hope for people and the planet. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And switching gears to the auto industry, the Toyota Motor Corporation says it will call back 190,000 more cars to replace potentially defective airbags made by Takata. The announcement comes as the auto parts maker resisted a nationwide recall ordered by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. The U.S. Safety Agency has told Takata to expand its recall of driver's side airbags, which have in some cases ruptured, shooting out metal shards. But Takata says it won't comply until there's a comprehensive investigation. Executives from Takata and two other leading automakers were grilled by U.S. Senators in Washington on Thursday over the safety concerns. Lawmakers criticized the Japanese company's response so far and accused them of being uncooperative. And we have got to get out of this defensive crouch about liability litigation and get into an offensive position about making sure drivers are safe. And until your companies decide to do that, until NHTSA is a more able and aggressive partner in that, consumers are going to be in the dark. Some 14 million vehicles across 10 different brands, including Ford, Honda and Toyota, have been recalled worldwide, with the exploding airbags attributing to five deaths and about 140 injuries so far. Calling it an unprecedented crisis, Japan's regulator reportedly said it may need to change its recall system for an improved response. And in South Africa, police, uh, uh, pl people rather, across the country are marking the first anniversary of the death of former President and Nobel Peace Laureate Nelson Mandela. A special wreath laying service was held in the administrative capital of Pretoria on this Friday. Family, government officials, foreign dignitaries and religious leaders took part in the ceremony as they looked back on Mandela's life. Dr. Rafaela, a fellow anti-apartheid activist, said it was an important day for the nation. I feel very encouraged. I feel proud that we as a nation, despite the mixed blessings of this year, we are able to stop and celebrate a great leader. South Africa's first black president passed away last year in December at the age of 95 after a long battle with illness and health problems. 
Family members said they hoped South Africa would continue to hold Mandela's legacy of freedom and honor his memory by living his values of peace and reconciliation. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here next week. Hello everyone, I'm Stephen Che with your look at Friday Sports. Now Tiger Woods is a fierce competitor. He's also a 14-time major winner and a philanthropist. But in his first round after four months off, he was in an unfamiliar position. That is, last place. At the Hero World Challenge, an off-season tournament benefiting his charity, Woods shot a 5 over par 77, putting him dead last at 18th and 11 shots behind the leader. The 38-year-old blamed his shaky short game, but was able to point out some positives. He said his power and speed were back, and most importantly, that he was playing without pay. The event continues through Sunday in Florida. Meanwhile, with the LPGA busy with its qualifying tournament, the top Korean and Japanese pros are gearing up to go heads up in a team tournament. The Korea-Japan Women's National Golf Team Match Play Competition will have double stroke play in round one before single stroke play in round two. A notable pairing in round one is world number one, Park in and number seven, Yu so Yun, Korea's one-two combination in group six. The two-day event has, or rather it tees off at Miyoshi Country Club in Aichi, Japan, Saturday. And turning to the KBL hardcourt, the Mobis Phoebus took on the Samsung Thunders in Ursan in the first of the doubleheader. And Mobis shows why they lead the league with Moon Taeyong and company firing on all cylinders. It's great team ball by the Phoebus as they strike down the Thunders with ease. Meanwhile, in Jeonju, the Koyang Orions put on a clinic against the KCC Aegis, dropping 63% of their shots to earn the big win on the road. Their 14th win puts them at fourth on the standings. Finally, in world football, Europe's football governing body has put the boot down on football teams from Crimea, playing in Russia's professional league. The UEFA Executive Committee decided today to prohibit Crimean clubs to play in competitions organized by the Russian Football Union as of 1st of January 2015 and <clears throat> for the region to be considered as a special zone. Now with the three clubs moving federations without consent, in addition to Russia's annexation of Crimea not being recognized internationally, UEFA was left with little choice other than to place the Crimean clubs in limbo until the regional conflict is sorted out. And that wraps it up for now. Stay tuned for your weather up next. Have a wonderful weekend and good night. TGIF, I'm Kim Bo-kyung with the latest weather updates. Snowy conditions continue here in Korea and heavy snowfall advisories have been issued for both the Tolado provinces as well as Jeju where snow is currently falling. And more is in store overnight. The mountainous areas of Jeju are looking to get over 10 centimeters. Conditions will gradually clear up by tomorrow morning and a cold wave watch and a dry weather watch have also been issued over in Kang province so if you are there make sure to stay warm and to drink plenty of water as for the weekend skies are looking bright and clear despite the cold however those in Jeju may get about five millimeters of precipitation on Saturday now Sunday will be chilly and clear and it looks like conditions will begin to ease up next week on to Saturday's readings Seoul drops to minus nine in the morning before reaching zero in the afternoon Gwangju hits three 
Busan reaches 6. On to other regions. Jeju makes it to 7, Dokdo reaches 2, Mount Kumgang drops to minus 10. Hope you have a wonderful Friday evening. Stay warm. Here's a look at the international weather. And that's primetime news for this Friday. I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for watching. And I'm Kang Chidi. Have a great weekend, everyone. We'll see you again soon.